I'd like to welcome you all to uh, the panel discussion, Mumia Abu-Jamal and the Politics of Mass Incarceration. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that in December of 2011, only three months ago, Mumia Abu-Jamal was released from death row. And uh, I think we have to say that this was one of the most important civil rights victories of the last 30 years. Um, in the 1990s, Mumia Abu-Jamal was scheduled to be executed on three different occasions, and an international movement saved his life, and uh, Manning Marable was certainly one of the activists and scholars in the United States who organized in the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal. I remember that in 2000, he organized a conference right here at Columbia University titled In Defense of Mumia Abu-Jamal. We have uh, uh, two very important speakers today. Mark Taylor is, I should know who Mark Taylor is because I work with him on a regular basis. Uh, he is founder and now co-coordinator of Educators for Mumia Abu-Jamal. He teaches theology and ethics in the religion and society area of Princeton Theological Seminary. His most recent book is entitled The Theological and the Political on the Weight of the World. He teaches courses on critical race theory, incarceration, and theology. He team teaches feminist and womenist theologies, empire and capital, colon, theological reconsider uh, considerations, and he also teaches libera the liberation theology of Gustavo Gutierrez. Mark Taylor is uh, my colleague and partner in crime in the movement to release Mumia Abu-Jamal, so I uh, am very honored uh, to be part of this panel, although I'm, I'm facilitating. We also have here with us uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who is a professor of geography uh, at the CUNY Graduate Center and a leading anti-prison activist. Dr. Gilmore examined the political and economic forces that produced California's prison boom in her excellent book, Golden Gulag, Prisons, Surplus, Crisis, and Opposition in Globalizing California. Uh, that book, Golden Gulag, won the American Studies Association Laura Romero First Book Award. She also explores the emergence of movements working to dismantle the prison industrial complex, highlighting the ways community-based activism has been successful in bridging urban, rural, racial, and other divides to achieve victories against the growing prison system. If we have time at the very end, we will play a recording by Mumia Abu-Jamal uh, on the work of Manning Marable. Without further ado, I want to turn it over to my colleague and comrade, Dr. Mark Taylor. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. It seems appropriate to have this session on Mumia Abu-Jamal and the politics of incarceration at a memorial conference on Manning Marable because of Manning's commitment to this struggle as well as so many more. I did not know Manning Marable well, mainly through his work, but had some correspondence with him along the way. And uh, it was indicative of his spirit, I think, that finally after I had asked him maybe too many times if he would sign some petition or be present at some press conference uh, with his name attached to it. He finally said to me once by email, Mark, uh, don't ask me anymore, just assume yes, use my name. 
And he said that as he headlined the 2000 ad we took out in the New York Times, which Professor Angela Davis also headlined for us. Uh, he wedded a politics of liberation beyond liberalism and progressivism to a magnanimous spirit, it seemed to me, and that gesture kind of suggests that, and everybody I've heard from here suggests that. Thanks to Johanna for your work not only in educators and on the basis of your past work and taking us to a whole new level, and I'm honored to be here with Professor Gilmore, whose book I've used, and Professor Gilmore, way back in the mid-1990s when the first death warrant was signed against Mumia, was one who helped me in the middle of the street once, I think, when I was trying to hold a banner up by myself, which isn't a good sign. <laughs> and, and she scurried to the rescue and took the other end, and we grew from there, uh, in part because of her critical voice as well as her uncompromising commitment. I thought what I would do on this session is to enumerate some reasons that I have found myself giving over the years, some 16 years now, on why the movement for Mumia Abu-Jamal is important. And because I've had to work in higher education with educators and students, most of the reasons I'm giving, as you'll see, might pertain to that group, not necessarily to those of us uh, gathered here. But in the academy, and sometimes outside the academy, I find people using an excuse to not work for Mumia or to be down for Mumia that is twofold. On the one hand, they say, well, um, it, Mumia is being turned into an icon. He's so special. He's being put up on a pedestal. In fact, a couple of my respected colleagues at one point finally stepped away from the movement for Mumia, Mumia saying, I'm just not a Mumiac. I guess, that was the word he used, as if it had just all gotten too extreme. On the other hand, the response I would get from people is, well, I don't work because I, for Mumia because there are just so many in the situation like Mumia's. Um, why the special attention on this case? Why have an organization of educators, or as you know, there was labor for Mumia, there were artists for Mumia, um, and many other organizations. Here are seven responses, and I can speak to these very, very quickly, and then I'll be happy to be a part of the conversation with you. I want to listen to you um, on your sense of this. Um, we've got good people here as well as on the, on the panel. First, I say that Mumia matters because if we want to create liberatory change, as distinct from only interpreting or criticizing oppression generally, then particular advocacies and movements are necessary. The system knows how to contain general discussion about imprisonment, mass incarceration, the death penalty, police violence either, but when you name names, not only of those who have been done injustice to, but also to the elites responsible for it, as in Philadelphia, names like Lynn Abram, we know well, McGill, Tom Ridge, who then governor, signed the death warrant on Mumia, Ed Rendell. When you name names and get specific, you start generating um, action. You start raising problems um, for the system. The second point I want to make, though, should go hand in hand with this, because it sounds like I'm throwing the focus on just an individual figure. The second reason is that Mumia has been gifted with an ability to forge his own struggle for personal liberation in a way that involves one in the collective power of broader struggle. Now, in some ways, I'm pilfering this point from John Edgar Wideman, the award-winning novelist who wrote an introduction to Mumia's book, Live from Death Row. And he points out in a lengthy discussion about how so often, even in the narratives coming out of communities of color, but other oppressed peoples, there is also, there is often the focus on an individual hero figure who kind of makes it out, and then that takes the place of thinking about the broader collective social dynamics. And Weidman made the point, and my experience is that when people encounter Mumia, this is right, that Mumia has a way, if he talks about his case directly, and he does it relatively rarely, 
Mumia has a way of involving those who come into contact with him with a broader struggle. Um, and it's a struggle that includes not only many people, but many issues, as you'll see um, in what I have to say, um, say below. Third point, Mumia matters because he has long been before and while on death row and now media savvy. He's a communicator. We know this well. He's a journalist. His writings appear in sources from the homeless street news to Yale Law Review, Forbes magazine even, as well as the left press. And this is important, whatever our critiques of the media may be, and they should be severe. Once at a Philadelphia press conference, a news man um, looked up from his book and asked me quickly, well, would you all be out here if, if Mudia, Mumia wasn't um, so media savvy and uh, could talk well and, and be a journalist? And uh, for some reason, I had the presence of mind to ask him, well, would you be here covering this if he wasn't media savvy and in, able to engage the media? And he had to admit, probably not. Um, so I think it's been important that we can engage a figure that knows how to engage the media and yet not be done in by the media and enable us to have a media voice as well. I'm sure there's many of you gathering here who have been out on issues for people and you just can't get the media. <laughs> And um, we have to be out there even if we don't and make our own media. But um, Mumia's gifts as a communicator are significant. Fourth, and I think this is very important, working with the insights and initiatives of Mumia Abu Jamal in this movement is one way to highlight the agency of imprisoned peoples themselves, especially in the corridors of liberal education. There's often a kind of paternalist sense that we have to help the incarcerated or have to help those on death row. Indeed, okay to a certain extent. But Mumia reminds us and educators time and again how important his voice is to initiate our insight to educate us both about thought and action. That's been my experience from letters with him. It's been my experience from suggestions he makes. This doesn't mean that his voice or his writings are immune from criticism. He's not the kind of person that would want that. Um, and Mumia, even in the prisons, is not isolated. You probably can recall times when other artists in prison have written and spoken um, for and with Mumia. Perhaps you remember a a hunger fast in, uh, on death row in Pennsylvania at one point that Mumia was supported in um, and drawn into by other prisoners. Once again, the agency of the imprisoned is crucial. Fifth reason is that the increasingly powerful fusion of corporate and legal law and criminal justice forces have long made Mumia their target in a special way, right? Not that he's been the only target, but they have made him a primary target. The lodge of the Fraternal Order of Police in Philadelphia, of course, has taken out a blacklist that they still maintain on a Danny Faulkner website, a list of all of us who have signed petitions for Mumia before. The intimidation factor is intense. Um, Professor Fernandez, when doing some organizing work for the big event we had on December 9th in Philadelphia, found out just how hard it is to hire a publicity agent who's going to be out for Mumia because the legal forces and the political forces will go to work to crack down on any advocacy for this man. Again, not that this man is to be lionized and made exceptional, but that is an important point. The FBI COINTELPRO's 700, 600 to 700 pages tracking Mumia Abu Jamal since he was 15 years of age as a Lieutenant of Information for the Black Panthers. I'm saying that Mumia Abu Jamal is one of those figures we can line up behind and when we do, push back at the heart of the state's intimidating surveillance and its attempt to repress dissent. Other cases allowed that don't make, um, don't misinterpret me, but um, given the way the system has targeted Mumia, our support for Mumia is a way to target that system that represses dissent. Sixth, 
Mumia helps us see that our struggle against U.S. mass incarceration, police violence, and the death penalty is a decolonizing struggle. In other words, it's not just a struggle going on in the United States having to do with U.S. criminal justice. It is a struggle, and Mumia's writings emphasize this time and again, that is embedded in a resistance to global capital, to a transnational project that puts the United States, and has for some time now, on something like a structural adjustment plan that is meted out to Latin America and countries across the global south. You know the basic two-step of that plan, demand that a country indebted to the wealthy European colonizing powers of the past, demand that a poor country strip itself of all of its social welfare plans, and then when people are frustrated and dissent and act up, then you send out a dragnet to sweep them into a penal state, into a carceral state. We're seeing something like that two-step, it seems to me, um, in the United States um, today. The Colonialists always used gender, sexuality, and a negative attack upon the land as part of their ways of colonization. And increasingly, it's interesting to me, in two audio essays that Mumia has sent to my class, he's focused on the way Western colonizers' repression, especially through religion, has involved the repression of women and of sexuality, and has been trying to imagine how things might be different politically with a, an embrace, he doesn't use the word yet, or at least I haven't seen him yet, uh, the embrace of a feminist critique of colonizing powers. This is an important part. Uh, his latest uh, missive into my class focused on Harriet Tubman and, um, and her work in particular. And then finally, I'd like to suggest that the Mumia movement positions, gives us a special location. Our resistance to mass incarceration and the death penalty and police violence around the U.S. National Shrine Center in Philadelphia. And that's significant. Philadelphia is that mythic July 4th celebrating Liberty Bell talking center of patriotic hype that keeps the mythology of America going. I think one of the significant consequences of our taking the December, taking the National Constitution Center a shrine hall in Independence Mall for our major event for Mumia on December 9th of 2011 was that we took that mythological center and we gave new meanings to the notions of freedom, a word much co-opted by the whole American dream language, right? And talked about liberation and particularly a liberation for Mumia Abu Jamal and on all the issues related to it. Taking on authorities in Philadelphia as well as throughout the world, as the Mumia case um, um, has done. This places our challenge to U.S. mass incarceration, to the death penalty, to prosecutorial misconduct and police violence in the very symbolic metropolitan heart of many Americans' self-understanding of their nation and its history. And it enables our struggle to be one that challenges the mythological confidence of the American nation state that would overlook how it is built on a tradition of genocidal violence, whether against its American Indian peoples in the slavery systems and the Middle Passage or in its wars in Vietnam and across the world. This imperial dynamic, this real harsh memory of the U.S. past is something that Mumia's writings always keep before us and make a dimension of our struggle too, so that we are not monocausal. We are not monodimensional in our approach to this movement. We are kept broad always. And in that, Mumia Abu Jamal remains a profound teacher among us and for us in educators for Mumia Abu Jamal. Thank you. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful afternoon. And I know that it's hard to see, but the pictures are, are more suggestive than illustrative anyway of what I'm going to say this afternoon. Um, I want to start with a couple of uh, preliminary comments, of course. First, to thank all of the organizers who put together this astonishing conference um, in honor of 
the continuing legacy of um, Manning Marable, who was not only a great scholar and activist, but also a true gentleman. I mean, in the most profound sense. And I'll tell you a little bit, little story, use some of my time up. Um, my parents, who have passed, um, used to take summer vacations in a working class neighborhood on Cape Cod. And they rented cottages in this neighborhood year in and year out. And one year, the cottage that they had become accustomed to was not available. And a friend of a friend said, oh, there's a house on Martha's Vineyard you could rent. Why don't you try that? So they tried it. They went out to Martha's Vineyard and were kind of put off by um, uh, the way that they thought many of the um, black people on Martha's Vineyard um, looked down on them because they weren't of the same social stat, uh, set, economic status, educational status, and so forth. And so they kind of suffered their vacations on the vineyard. They liked it because it was beautiful, but they weren't very happy. And one day, some years ago, when both my parents were still alive, uh, my husband and I were visiting them on the vineyard, and we were in that restaurant down in Oak Bluffs near the jetty called the Ocean View, I think. And in walked Manning Marable and Leith Mullins. And Manning looked across the restaurant, saw us, decided he probably knew us even if he didn't, and walked right over and introduced himself and Leith, and very graciously asked after my parents, because they were the elders at the table, how they were and so forth, and then asked after me and af after Craig. And they went away. And my father turned to me and said, that guy's all right. <laughs> That's high praise from my father. <laughs> and Leith, I always meant to write you that story, and I never did. So I'm glad I could tell it in your presence. Um, I also uh, want to especially thank Johanna for inviting me to participate in this panel. And we did one panel together a couple of months ago. And I am just awed by her energy and brilliance. So I'm very happy to be here today with her. And I want to thank Mumia Abu-Jamal for all of the reasons that my colleague and um, comrade Mark Taylor just outlined to us. Uh, the ways that Mumia Abu-Jamal insists that we think about the entire world and is willing and able to use himself in his many talents as well as his capacity as a captured person to focus our attention on the big picture as well as uh, the individual picture, to think the world and not just him. And one of the phrases that Mark used that uh, are going to inform what I have to say this afternoon is that um, Mumia does teach us that the struggle uh, is in every way embedded in resistance to global capital. And I am wearing my hammer and sickle scarf for those who can't see. Um, at the end of the 20th century, the painter Sandow Burke uh, created uh, uh, paintings of California's 33 major prisons. This is one of them, High Desert, built obviously on stolen land in Northern California. The landscape paintings layer historical geographies of productive space. They make us wonder. Modern prisons were born and grew up with the United States. Competing notions of freedom shaped the planetary movement of people and relationships. Incarceration shifted punishment from the flesh to the body. It was a reform. What purpose? So that those who are feared for their crimes, reads the original penitentiary in Trenton, New Jersey, can learn fear of the law and be useful. Like lives, early sentences were short. State making then at the margin of highly differentiated freedom to produce workers not already compelled by indenture, by patriarchy, by slavery. Sentences got longer when other compulsions abated. The net widened. Black people, white women, indigenous people, children, and so on. State making, but also war making. To what purpose? Population transfer, territorial conquest, partition, cleansing, forced labor, starvation, direct murder. In the 20th century, incarceration intensified 
innovations in industrialized killing. I'm going to say that again. In the 20th century, incarceration intensified innovations in industrialized killing. Britain concentrated the boar in South Africa at the beginning of the 20th century. They named the concentration camp. Germany concentrated the Herero people in Southwest Africa a few years later. They also named the concentration camp. Germany again. Poles, Jews, Slavs, communists, gay people, lesbian, trans transgender people, disabled people. The Allies concentrated diverse peoples for African and Asian resource extraction. The United States concentrated Japanese and Japanese Americans. This is, thus there is a contradiction at the center of incarceration, of all of it, taking freedom to make it. Today, wherever inequality is deepest, incarceration is most prevalent. This is on a global scale. I'm trying to think, as Mumia has taught me to think, to share these thoughts this afternoon. This chart pictures the group of seven, the world's richest countries, and the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, um, India, uh, uh, CC, China, and South Africa. Uh, this chart pictures the G7 and BRICS incarceration rate, and the rate is number of people per 100,000 uh, residents. And let me see if I can point out to you. There's the USA, number one. There's Russia. Remember, this is not the Soviet Union. This is Russia, post-communist. Russia, number two. South Africa, Brazil. The world average hovers around here, but most countries in the world are way out here. The picture for the planet, in other words, is a long, flat tail, chasing zero, but not infinity. Incarceration defines the contemporary United States. One in 100 adults, 25% of the world's prisoners, first among unequals. Let me repeat. Wherever inequality is deepest, incarceration is most prevalent. For what purpose? Not forced labor. A little rehabilitation, a dash of deterrence, mostly incapacitation, iced by retribution. Incarceration holds prisoners hides them in bright light. The soundscape is a din. Monologue, conversation, television, machinery, people shouting, people crying, people in pain, counts. Like anyone locked away, people in prison are psychologically vulnerable. Neurotic symptoms are common, sleep problems, worry, fatigue, irritability, depression. Depression. The USA's massive prison growth over the past 30 years has not been driven by crime. It has been driven by the increased likelihood that an arrest will lead to a charge, will lead to an indictment, will lead to a conviction, will lead to a sentence. The accumulation of these likelihoods leads to another depression, individualized, economic, perpetual. The work does not make us free. 65 million modestly educated people in the prime of life are banned from many formal labor markets. Lives shrink outside the walls. There are places formerly incarcerated people, some convicted persons, some associates of theirs, and some associates of their associates cannot go. The lines are invisible, but operate like international borders. Crossing invites being seized. Here is a map of one Los Angeles region where civil law, not criminal law, banishes certain people from the brightly colored areas called injunction zones. 
Shrunken economic and spatial mobility extends the car carceral to a perpetual state of exclusion, even when walls disappear. The invisible walls depend on how the law can be used as cudgel or judge after a breach. The carceral is a seemingly boundless boundary-making apparatus. Virtual barriers can be easily enforced using ankle monitors like the Nexus One. Such machines have sensors to detect alcohol and drugs in the wearer's sweat. They phone police. They can speak. You have left the master zone, one model tells immigrant detainees. You have entered the master zone, it says when they turn back. Which way freedom? Relative liberty, in a monitor rather than a cage, carries a price. So many dollars for setup, plus dollars per day, charged to the wearer, a hefty cost against a shrunken wage. In order to pay his daily freedom fix in the master zone, a man cut copper wire from phone lines with the intent to sell. He was caught, though not, he was caught. A bit of copper, though not enough to scrounge for sale, is essential for the monitor to work. China is the world's leading refiner of copper wire. It is also a leading producer of copper ore, mined from loads concentrated in Africa from the Democratic Republic of Congo to Zimbabwe. The average productive life of a copper mine is 37 years, close to the average age of an incarcerated person in the United States. One ore extraction method is called the liberation process. Liberation miners organize against casualization and bad pay. They desire barriers to secure the possibility for well-being and express these politics in territorialized terms called resource nationalism by both supporters and detractors. Great Zimbabwe, this city, Great Zimbabwe's Iron Age walls, the city was built in the year 1100, Great Zimbabwe's Iron Age walls had work to do. Imur or hold in concentrated surpluses and partition space into a specific landscape for living, for production, for beauty. China traded there too. Borders are not always so stony, though frequently hard. Every time I'm reviewing my slides in PowerPoint and I select this one, it bounces. That's odd. A landmine is a weapon designed to let its victim make the ultimate effort to release its grievous harm, maiming or death. The inverse of a drone, a mine waits. Instead of the carceral immuring a body, flesh finds the minimally visible wall. What purpose? To keep somebody apart? to blow some bodies apart. Contemporary barriers, obstacles to mobility and motion, are not confined to sensors strapped to ankles or explosives hidden in the fragrant earth. Here is the triple wall under construction at the US-Mexico border. Like the Great Wall of China, visible from outer space. We began with a story of motion, people, ideas, relationships. This is what matters most. The faster, the faster and more fungible the concentrated things are, cash money rather than, say, copper ore, the less virtual or portable the barrier, perhaps or not. Two overlapping U.S. groups feature inverted particularities, those not documented to work and those, the 65 million or more, documented not to work. They carry partition in their skin. 
not as a brand, but as a distinctive impediment. The border wall waits quietly as a landmine. People die there, too. Lucretius teaches that death cannot be lived. Yet, we think the earliest cities arose at burial grounds. Ritual concentration of remains, collective decision to protect and tend, and individual need to renew ancestral connection established in plotted and enclosed locations and their resident living caretakers as the kernel of civilization itself. This man, Adnan, a Lebanese, mines the mass grave at the edge of Beirut's Shatala Palestinian refugee camp. His entire family of 38 died in the massacre. Implotment as geographic ordering of space and implotment as narrative ordering of time conjoin in living death. Here lies that which was my sister. The mode marks abundant space and time with meaning, longing, specificity. Yet even death is not the final equalizer, but rather an ultimate form of inequality. War on the perpetually dead provides insights into perpetual war against the living. The artist and experimental geographer Trevor Paglin calls this photograph invisible. People move until they can't. Today, incapacitation justifies U.S. incarceration. What purpose? Do nothing. Territorial partition, population transfers, and racial murder completely shaped the 20th century. Let me repeat. Territorial partition, population transfers, and racial murder completely shaped the 20th century, the age of human sacrifice. Its remains animate the present. Invisible is a prison, a military base, a border, maybe all. In the early 21st century, we wonder. Territorial partition, population transfer, and incarceration define the 20th century. Why is Mumia and his defense so important? And why is it that the deeper and wider the inequality, the greater the level of incarceration? We should open it up for discussion, questions, observations. Yes, please. I try to follow the politics of our nation in particular and the global scene in general very closely. My impression is that so much is going on in the world and most particularly in the United States that is ominous And I wonder if at this point in time, it's going to be possible to turn around the kinds of things which we are talking about in regard to prison reform um, or oppression of the poor 
and in particular war on women, are we going to be able to turn it around without some form of violent reaction? I am a child of the 30s, and I've been paying attention for a long time. And it is so bad and so uh, pervasive. And I hear this coming not just from myself, not just from me, but from various sources on the major media as well as on public education media. So I'm wondering if there is so much going on that we cannot coalesce groups such as this quickly enough to make a real difference in the, in the behavior and the decision making of those who have the power. I'll speak to that and not just out of uh, my work uh, with educators for Mumia, but also with um, years of work in various anti-war groups and solidarity work in, with Central America and activists, particularly in Guatemala and Mexico. I, I share the skepticism that, as you put it, we cannot coalesce our groups quickly enough to stem the tide. But I also believe that the tide is such that it's marked by a cumbersomeness and perhaps, yes, a chaos that will include violence, that we need to coalesce nevertheless to take advantage of the space to move into new worlds that we might see. It's going to take not only solid organizing, it's going to take imagination, it's going to be it's going to take something that Mumia talked about at the end of the, of the recent communique, taking care of each other um, to prepare for what's coming. Because it's big, and I think organizing in movements like that for Mumia, Abu Jamal, and incarceration broadly, puts us on the front of a grand struggle. And uh, if we coalesce, it's not out of an idealism that we're going to turn things around right away, but things are top heavy, they're portending chaos, and it's time to, to, to build coalitions and to coalesce as we can, which I think is one of the exciting things that this, uh, that is talked about in our program about uh, Liberation Summer, mm -hmm. where we, we start to think together with the Occupy movement, the critique of capital, with the criminalization of peoples of color in our nation, represented by mass incarceration and police violence and the courts and all, and um, bring that coalition together especially and move forward with creativity. I'd like to add, um, if I may, that things in the United States are so hard and so dire and yet for so many people softened by the relative abundance of stuff. Um, that I, even though I organize here all the time and do political work here all the time, I'm really often dismayed by how little imagination we allow ourselves to have about what the world should be like. We were talking last night at the liberation at a liberation summer gathering, which was amazing, and there were what a hundred people in the room and so forth, um, about ha having to be bolder and to give up um, any pretense of thinking that tweaking Armageddon is somehow going to bother Armageddon. Armageddon's tough and not ticklish. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is that just as um, in recent, in the recent last 12 months, people in the occupations or liberations or decolonizations around the United States have looked to their brothers and sisters and others in um, uh, the Middle East, in North Africa and West Asia for um, in inspiration 
and uh, ideas, so it is that revolution has moved around the world constantly through the movement of ideas and people and thoughts. And so, and that's why I said that's what's most important in my talk. Um, and so I think that in the United States today, we would do well as we craft new ways of building coalitions to pay close attention to how our um, comrades in the struggle around the world have done the same and how it is that they have won, whether by taking over a factory and running it for themselves or setting up you know, alternative systems or stopping work in prisons or doing things like that. Sometimes it's formal, sometimes it's informal, but there are seven billion people on this planet who have excellent ideas and who have put those ideas into practice. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, so my question um, is about specifically like issues of gender. And I was just wondering, have you guys ever heard of Cece McDonald? Okay, Cece McDonald is this black transgender woman. Oh, I was reading about that today. Yeah. Democracy Now. Yes. Yeah. So the story's been around for like half, like nine months, more than a year. She's this black transgender woman from Minnesota, um, and she was out with her friends who were mostly black and queer or allies. And she, um, these like white people started calling them faggots and chicks with dicks and all this stuff. And she walks up to them and says, you know, hate speech is wrong, that's it. And so an ass they assault her and her friends, and then someone, one of the attackers is stabbed, and now she is the only person who is charged with um, two degree, second degree murder, um, has two charges. And this is happening in Minnesota right now, and there's this big movement against it. And so what I was wondering is, um, Mr. Taylor mentioned, he mentioned, I mean, kind of just like words out there, lesbian, gays, transgender, right? Um, and like, of course I agree that capitalism and the prison system has this like genocidal violence that's inherent to how it functions. And what it does is create, you know, through race and gender most obviously, make mark the human body as something that can be um, pr produced and that can be labeled for economic purposes and also for social purposes, right? And these, this aspects like the biologics of capitalism that renders human beings product, you, you know, you, you, tools for labor, you know, in the economic sense of the word and also so, like how we function socially as tools. One of the places where it's most violently enforced is in prisons, right? Which is what the kind of like prison abolition or prison reform movement is kind of about. So, and, uh, you know, I've read Mumia Abu Jamal's books, and like I, of course, like of course I support him. And don't I think that question of you know why is he being like the celebrity now is kind of ridiculous and not uh, not about it. But what I do think is important is I mean, there's this book that just came out recently saying uh, um, talking about gender and the prison system, and like why do you why why haven't you guys heard of Cece McDonald? You know, like. There, there, I don't, you're talking about coalitions. This is probably, in terms of black and Latino people who are incarcerated the most, transgender people are also the most violently harassed and assaulted in terms of the prison industrial complex. Um, and black transgender women, even more so. Like the, the age for um, a transgender person of color, I think, or a transgender woman is like 27 years old in this country in this country, which is ridiculous. So I guess just my questions were, you know, um, for, you know, the lack of a better word, right, right, right. Why haven't we incorporated, why hasn't the analysis been more, what can we do, I guess, to kind of deepen the analysis? And like, I guess just for this conference in general, which like, I mean, I haven't been here since Thursday, but um, I just, I do think a deeper analysis of, of gender tied to race is definitely needed. And I think the prison um, discourse is perfect for it since it is so, it, since it's a site of violent reinforcement. So I was just wondering what you guys thought about that. And like, especially with Liberation Summer, was there anyone yesterday who talked about these issues? You know, like I feel like, you know what I mean? Like sometimes there's no place or sometimes you only hear 
people talking about certain issues in their certain places and not, not actually ever building coalitions. So I was just wondering what you guys thought about that. Well, to answer your last question, yes, there were. Oh, yes? Yes, of course. Um, and uh, I, I'd say that having not, I confess to not having heard of C.C. McDonald. However, I have heard of many other cases of many other black, Latino, and other, other transgender people um, who identify in multiple ways. One of the um, uh, struggles that we have going on uh, in California now, I say we, I live in New York, but I still do a lot of political work in California because California is a country that just happens to be uh, part of the United States. Um, we have going on now is that um, the state of California, Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, decided to um, set up a gender responsive corrections commission. I hope your hair just burst into flames, all right? Because you know what the, where this is going. Where it's going is um, not only to say old fashioned binary two genders, what's appropriate for men, what's appropriate for women, but rather let us be attentive to and sensitive to the multiple genders that people express, um, uh, gender self-determination, and find out what the experiences are for um, people in prisons for men and people in prisons for women, and what do you think the answer is gonna be? Build new prisons for um, some range of people who are between these poles, which stay stiff. This, I know that's not what you're talking about, I'm saying that's what they're doing. So the analysis is already there and working against that, both inside and outside. Um, and I'm always open to uh, recommendations for how specifically to deepen analysis, using your words. Any deepening of analysis we need. So thank you. And I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, yeah, thank you for putting the case before us, that particular one. I was not up on that one. Um, I had an activist call into my class who works with transgendered people in our prisons, and the general statistics about sexual violence in our prisons generally are, are horrific by almost any analysts I know, not only the, the repression and discrimination that women in general feel, but um, the latest reports I saw stressed that there are about 600 cases of some form of sexual assaults uh, per day, about 25 per hour in our prisons. And in fact, our prisons manufacture conditions that reinforce and intensify the violence against women and the violence against those with different sexualities from the heteronormative pattern. Um, and it is worse, especially, as I understand the studies, for transgender people of color in the prisons who are, are targeted in, in multiple levels. And uh, so we need to deepen and complexify our analysis, I agree. I'm not, um, one of the reasons I actually, I like working with in prison activism is because I do hear this spoken of, although perhaps not enough. Um, um, Dr. Angela Davis has a chapter on gender in her book on um, is uh, the prison obsolete and uh, that's one good place to start and other figures too. Um, on the hope making side, uh, Professor Gilmore has this great chapter six on mothers reclaiming their children and thinking through gender and, and, is, and to some degree sexual violence issues too. So deepen and complexify, and thanks for taking us there with, with that challenge. Yes. Please. Okay, hi. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> stuff. So obviously you guys aren't on Twitter if you don't know about C.C. McDonald because it's been, it's been a campaign that's happened a lot, at least that's where mm -hmm. we've been doing it. But, mm -hmm. And I'm glad you raised that, but you know, it's a huge problem. I mean, we're still in this city, we're still fighting for some of the men involved in the prison justice movement to, um, to let us talk about women. So <laughs> women in prison and trans in prison. I just do want to say that critical resistance, which at least Ruthie and Angela both represent, is one of the places where the issue of trans viol violence against trans, uh, transgender people in prison has been raised. 
um, and it is in development. And I think that what's important about raising it here is that the, the point of Liberation Summer that's exciting to me is that it's about a vision. It's about replacing, you know, we can't go piece by piece. Mm -hmm. We have to have something better. You know, in this city, we're trying to mobilize against the NYPD, which for years has been the chief, not only the chief killer of, of young people of color, especially black people for years and years, but is also the main obstacle to getting long-term prisoners parole, and especially political prisoners. Okay, so in, in, a, in fighting the NYPD, we can't just say, we want you to stop doing this and this. We have to have visions of community control, and those have to lead to a vision of a liberatory kind of society. So I wanted to say those things and hope that you come to Liberation Summer and join and, and add that. Um, I just wanted to say one other thing I was thinking about while you were talking about Mumia, especially starting with you, Mark. Um, I think the other thing, I mean, you've, you said this about law enforcement. One of the things about Mumia that always, that made him immediately an enemy was that he had stood up to the police, like Move. I think that's why Move got in so much trouble. They just said, Where, you know, so what? You're the police. Um, so that's one thing. But the other thing is, that, and it's ironic, because it is focusing on an individual case, his political prisoners, um, people on death row, whatever they are, raises the issues in a more... Uh, concrete way, but also for Mumia, because he's the example. Put me on death row, I don't stop. Take me off death row and put me in prison with no hope of getting out, I don't stop. I, not only do I not stop, but I don't focus only on, oh, poor me and poor me, but I raise the issues. And that image of collective resistance is, I believe, what will get us to the place, because yes, it is really dire, and when we look at the individual cases you get, and when we get one more um, no from the parole board for guys who've been in for 40 years, Black Panthers, you get really depressed. But that vision of collective resistance and of the refusal to, uh, to, you know, to collapse in the face of that is, I think, what gets us through, and Mumia represents that. Thank you. Laura. Thank you. Well said. Yes. First, thanks everyone always for your amazing remarks. Um, I wanted to raise the question, um, and, and the past couple of presentations have made me, or remarks have made me think of it too, and it's been on my mind around the Trayvon Martin case and all the work that various people have been doing in various places around that, which is um, in terms of building coalition and building solidarities of the kind you describe, which I completely agree with, within the United States, between the United States and the rest of the world, um, is, is really pose the question of um, carceral solutions as justice to the multiplicities of crimes that we are struggling around. And I really would love it if you guys could speak to that. I've, I've heard you do so before, but if you could really address that. I mean, I think there are a lot of young people looking for justice for Trayvon Martin and not seeing another person incarcerated is part of that story, even as we know George Zimmerman needs to be held accountable, or more broadly, the society in which George Zimmerman is allowed to flourish as an ideologue and as a kind of a, um, a person just doing something legal. Um, but, but to think about those questions, and I think of this particularly in terms of hate crimes, um, there is a group now of students and educators in Illinois who are um, queer identified, who are um, demanding no expulsions and no suspensions for students, even who are accused of hate crimes toward their fellow students, that they're just simply saying there are other ways that we have to take responsibility for a conversation about justice and community and restoration. So even in cases where there is violent, homophobic activity taking place, these young people are still saying these kids should not be kicked out of school for this, that all that does is make their lives uh, less possible and less viable. So I just wonder if people would speak to those kinds of concerns um, in the broadest sense. I think it's one of the places that coalition building is really up against in, in making mm -hmm. a political statement about what we're for and what we're against. Thank you. Thank you for that really important question. Um, oh, I had, I had too many thoughts and now I just went blank. So um, the, the, first thing, the first thing that 
I want to say is something that all of us who are abolitionists say all the time. Let's talk about, take the question of violence. We are not interested in coming up with a better scheme for punishment when people commit violence. What we want to do is end violence. That is our goal. And it's therefore something that's complicated and long-term and not guaranteed. So that's one thing I want to say. The abolitionist view is to think, what can we do to end violence? Not, how can we punish people better? That is a separate question from, as you were saying, um, whether or not somebody who does something heinous is brought to account for it. Um, there is a view that what abolitionists are, are a bunch of people who want to shrug their shoulders and say, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Well, there are 2.9 million people or 3 million people locked up in prison. Let's just turn the key and open the door and say, it doesn't matter. Of course it matters, because what matters is the life we live together. Um, I have a friend who teaches, a in, who runs a Montessori school, and she told me a story this morning that blew me away, and I told her I was going to tell it today, so here it goes. I'll tell it fast. So in, in her school, the classes are limited to 22 children. There's a whole bunch of teachers for each classroom. It's Montessori, right? And Montessori is all about becoming a good person, right? Not becoming good at math or getting good at the test. And uh, in one of the classes, and these are little, little kids, in one of the classes there was one kid who, for all different kinds of reasons, some obvious, some known only to the child and probably not articulable by her, was completely disruptive all the time. Always fighting, always disrupting, always being a very big problem. And she would throw tantrums and kick and hit and bite and scream. So the teachers in this school with this little child do what's called a therapeutic hug. You all know the therapeutic hug, right? It's, it's like a straight jacket, only it's not because it's a human who's holding you rather than a jacket that's restraining you. And so they hold the child in their arms and put their legs around her legs so that she can't hurt herself, she can't hurt the teacher, she can't hurt the other children, she can't destroy things. And they talk to her the whole time. They say, I'm going to hold you until you're calm, I'm going to hold you until you're not going to hurt anybody, and so on and so forth. It took them the entire year last year to get this girl from where she was when she started school to where she was when the school year ended, but they got her there. Some of the parents in the class of the other children said, well, this is wasting our kids' time because our kids should be learning their ABCs and their one, two, threes. And Janet, my friend, who's the head of the school, it's University Montessori School in Charlottesville, Virginia, told the parents, this is the most important thing we can teach the children in this school, that when somebody is troubled and makes trouble, the last thing we do is make them go away. The last thing we do is disappear them. The last thing we do is say that efficiently, what's more important is that you learn to do something we will ensure you learn to do anyway, rather than we learn to live together in this community of people, some of whom are troubled and need particular intense care. That's abolition in action, and that's what we're talking about. I'll let that stand. That was a good response. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just was hoping to um, say something. I introduced myself to Dr. Gilmore um, when I came into the rotunda. And I want to give something um, for people to think about, to hold on to, because this is such a huge, huge um, thing to wrap yourself around and try and figure out how you can fit in um, to help. Um, but I want to just say to people, we have to do it. Um, I um, left the federal prison. I was released from a federal prison this past July. And I was um, warehoused, crammed into a, a federal prison with 2,000 other women. 95% um, of those women were mothers. Uh, many of them came from this city right here. And I want to just say, I left there. We, we um, because of Dr. Gilmer, and I came here um, to this conference, not only because of the words of, of Manning Marable, um, 
but because of Dr. Gilmore, I heard that she was going to be here. Because we took her book, which I brought with me um, to ask her to sign. That book was sent in to me, into the federal prison, and um, we organized using her book. We read it together, um, and we organized, and we, cr we created an organization called Families for Justice as Healing. Um, and the women within the federal system, that's our organization. And um, I wanted to publicly um, say thank you to Dr. Gilmore um, and to everybody else here, Dr. Davis, to all the people who have continued to speak out and continued to teach us and continue to believe and to hold out hope that we can do something to turn this around. Because I'm, I'm not kidding when I tell you, I just left a federal prison crammed full of black and Latino women who are mothers, who are crying out to be heard, who are doing unconscionably long periods of time. 10 and 15 year sentences for what we cannot figure out. And their children are dying on the streets, they are hungry, they are starving, and they are struggling on their own out here to survive. So if that just helps people to understand that we have to hold out hope that we can make a change, and if we can organize from inside of a federal prison mm -hmm. where we were threatened with being put in the shoe for organizing and all of the other things that we had to overcome. We had no books. Somebody sent me Dr. Gilmore's book just because they knew we had no books. If we can do it, all of us have to do it mm -hmm. um, for those of us who are still there. So mm -hmm. thank you, Dr. Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, and everybody else that's here that's participated in this conference in honoring Manny Marable, who was our great defender. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to mention Liberation Summer because it's been mentioned here a few times. The question is, what is Liberation Summer? Liberation Summer is a project begun uh, in February of this year. It was initiated by a group of activists here in New York working on issues of incarceration, but also involved in the Occupy movement. And the goal of Liberation Summer is essentially to build a united front with all of the various groupings that are out there already working on issues of incarceration, health, political prisoners, the case of Mumia Abu Jamal, bringing them together so that we are more, right, than our component parts. And essentially, our goal is to do for the issue of incarceration what Occupy did for the issue of class stratification and capitalism in American society. We want to blow the top open uh, of this issue. And so we're launching a summer of training, education, and activism. And hopefully, we will live beyond the summer and we will have a liberation fall and a liberation winter. Our website is liberationsummer.org or you can come uh, speak to any one of us uh, to get involved uh, with that project. And last night we had a spirited conversation with over 70 or 80 activists from different organizations uh, that were present and ready for the job that you um, that you outline. I'm going to uh, give it to you in a minute, but I just just wanted to say a few things because uh, the fact is that there seems to be an opening uh, around this issue, especially amongst people who've been victims of the uh, carceral state, um, but still. In American society, most people think that prisons and incarceration are a way to deal with social problems. But we've been presented a completely different picture, that with the intensification of industrialization under capitalism, 
incarceration has grown exponentially. And that leads us to the conclusion that incarceration has absolutely nothing to do with solving social problems. So can, can we wrap up by trying to very easily and quickly give a sense of what, what is the purpose of incarceration under capitalism? Uh, and how might we begin the process of flipping the script in American society? Because this is a war, we're engaged in a war of ideas and analysis, right? Our task is to convince Americans and the world that incarceration is not about reform or, or putting people uh, in prison who are problems in society. And on that note, I, I want to just end before you speak and possibly others by talking about one of the other very important lessons about the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal. And this is something that Manning Marable mentioned um, in the 1990s about his case. Uh, every generation, in every generation, the state makes it its objective to make an example out of someone who challenges the status quo. And if you look at American history, the, um, the labor activists in Chicago in the 19th century, the Haymarket Martyrs, were the, uh, the people who resisted and fought against capitalism that the state hanged. Then you have the Sacco and Vanzetti case, and then you have the Rosenberg case. You have the Black Panther Party and Mumia Abu-Jamal in this period. These are revolutionaries who challenged the very basis of hegemony and capitalism, and the state is determined to make an example out of them. This is why defending political prisoners is so important, because ultimately the issue of political prisoners, and Mumia Abu-Jamal is one of them, ex exposes the real um, uh, uh, purpose of incarceration which is about repression, repression of the bottom 1%, repression of those who resist, repression of those who dare to stand up against the violence of the state. So I want you to comment on that and tell us something about what we might do today in a moment that speaks of possibility, really. Because not long ago, we had throngs of black and Latino people marching in the streets around Trayvon Martin. And so this is, a, this is not a period to go home and start crying. This is really a moment to be seized. So the question is, what is to be done? Uh, and, 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 and now I'm going to give it to you. And if there's anyone else who has a final question, please move up to the mic. I feel that incarceration is a new form of slavery. It is nice to think that, okay, you know, when we're fighting a cause and okay, they're gonna target us, that, that goes without saying. But they are incarcerating our youth from high school. They're doing CMT testing scores in order to build prisons. So to me, it, it has been taken to a whole new level. That if you're to, we have to sit now and say, do we leave our kids in this school system that is teaching them to hate us, by the way, anytime they have to think they're inferior to anyone. So, but we have no choice. I don't think we don't have many options of where we're gonna send our kids when we know that nowadays, we, you don't even have to be a freedom fighter or a revolutionary, and you're being sent to jail as a young black male from school, from high school. They're involved in the police are in there. They're, uh, speaking of Trayvon, the racial tension of him just wearing a hoodie and being black. This is something our kids deal with every single day. So you're right, and you answered one of my questions by saying this organization you have to go for this summer. I think that's beautiful. I think everybody needs to jump on board because I feel like you. 
I almost think it has to come to violence. I don't want it to come to violence, but I don't see any other way. I don't see how we are going to make the system recognize that the, the slaughter of black children, men, and everybody being incarcerated is just, we're going to trust you to stop it? How's that going to happen? We've been begging and begging and begging for how long? I don't see it. And I think it's sad because they're not even, they've never, our kids haven't even had a chance to even figure out who they are, any type of revolutionary, nothing. And they're being incarcerated for little or nothing, a massive amount of time. Mm -hmm. And black people, young, the youth, the elders, and the neighbors, they're walking around scared. If the police roll up behind you, you're like, well, then am I doing something? Oh my God. Straighten them out. You, you can't move this way. Don't do that. You might get shot. You might get tased, beat up. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Something has to give because people cannot continue to take it. You can't even send, no, people I know don't even want to send their kids to school anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, I think you might be better off bringing them to my living room and we teach them there. Because for what they're doing and the way they're setting them up in their mentality to hate society, to hate power authority, simply because of the way the teachers treat them. Mm -hmm. So something serious, I hope we're not too late. I hope it doesn't. I think that the lack for the black community being connected directly to Africa We've been sent all over the world, and nobody wants us. We're living in the trenches. We're living in the squalors. We're begging for money to eat, to make it day by day. So to me, repatriation almost has to happen. You can't, we don't have a home here. That's how a lot of people feel. And we don't really foresee you giving us one here. And so our, we need to get reconnected to Africa, I think it would make the community here stronger. It would make the community there stronger. And if Africa can ever unite as a United States of Africa and we can get the dual citizenship, I think everybody would be stronger and happier. But it would give us more to know that somebody really does care about us. Mm -hmm. Short, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll move. I know the time is ticking. Uh, the first commenter from the audience was a child of the 30s. I'm a child of the 60s, and we just heard from a very eloquent and impressive uh, former uh, detainee at a federal prison. So, but as a child of the 60s, I can just tell you, I never would have thought we'd had a black president. Uh, and that's a dilemma for a lot of black people as to which way to go now. And with regard to our session today, with the focus on Mamiya and incarceration, I never would have thought we'd have a black attorney general in the United States. So if I were to, who happens to hail from New York City, as all of you know, so if I were to bring Eric Holder here now for 30 minutes and give him 10 minutes with each one of you, what would you say to him, what would you have him do other than resign and protest the way, Mar <laughs> the, the way uh, Marion Wright Edelman's husband did in the Bill Clinton thing? Mm -hmm. And I'd be... <laughs> Happy to also ask the opinion of uh, Dr. Davis, Professor Davis, if she'd comment on that too before we break. Mm -hmm. Very last short question, and then we're going to give it back. Good, Frank. This is a question rather than a statement. Um, I think when we've been discussing uh, the issue of the prison industrial complex and we're talking about the massive transfers of population, um, something that's useful for me in terms of thinking about that, um, how to struggle against that is the way that Professor Gilmore defines power, which is capacity rather than an object. And so when we're talking about our capacity to uproot and dismantle the prison industrial complex, we're talking about a, uh, a constellation of forces and, and I think at this moment a constellation of experiments in which we're trying to, f to figure out what's useful. Um, 
rather than an object, rather, uh, rather than the, the one strategy that will pick up and, and, and develop a united front or uh, a movement in which everyone is marching behind a certain front. Um, so uh, uh, the question, sorry, that was a statement. The question is, if you could identify either forces, which would be ideal, but experiments that give hope that you see articulated within this constellation that can um, be identified as a broader abolitionist movement, um, I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Can I just mention one thing that I haven't mentioned, and I, I, I have to footnote Ruth Gilmore on this. The idea of a united front, for me at least, emerged at that City College event in which you used that word, and when the liberation summer project came to me, I thought immediately of United Front, and we've wedded Liberation for, uh, Summer with United Front, so I just want to footnote and credit you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Two um, okay, two, two minutes. minutes. Two minutes. So, first of all, thank you all for your spirited and challenging um, thoughts and comments. I do this so that I can learn, not just so I can preach and teach. Uh, though I really wanted to be a preacher when I was a little girl. Didn't work out because I became an atheist, so. <laughs> Can I say? Um, so, so a few things. One, um, all, all political work, no matter what, whether it's on the left, the far left, the far, far left, or the right or the center, is experiment. We, we, we think of ways that we want the world to be, and we set out a scenario. We might call it policy, we might call it theory, whatever we call it. We set out a scenario to realize that, just like we all set out scenarios every day when we get up so that we can get through our day, right? We're always theorizing. Um, and so there are all of these experiments, to start with Brian's question first, that are already going on all over the country experiments in organizing, experiments in alternative forms of being in the world. Some are small, some are big. There are also experiments going on outside of the United States, which I was talking about before, that's really important. For example, when I put up the slide with the incarceration rates, and I said, wherever inequality is deepest, incarceration is most prevalent. But we see it going down in some of those places. Brazil is an example. Brazil is not utopia, but it is a place where over the last eight, nine years, the, labor, the Workers' Party has been in power and they have redistributed massive amounts of income. Have they cry, uh, smashed capitalism? No. But they have taken a lot of the surplus and spread it around, and this has made incarceration go down and lives go up. Um, there are also examples we can see from around the, around the world in which places have ended not just the death penalty, they've abolished life sentences. Right? That's still tweaking Armageddon, because there are still cages, but the melt-out of people from lockups to back into communities has been incredible because they said incarceration is not for keeping people forever. Incarceration is not for a whole bunch of things that the United States insists it is for, and so on and so forth. It's for relatively a relatively narrow band of of, um, of actions that people might commit. And the best way that I can summarize what that means is this, and I'm gonna repeat myself on purpose. Where life is precious, life is precious. It's really straightforward, right? So if you see, if you see a country that does not have life sentences, including when somebody willfully kills another person, you also see the, the incidence of willful killing of another person is low. They don't have low sentences because people are not prone to kill each other. People are not prone to kill each other because the state is model behavior saying life is precious. That's the first principle of this place. A state can do that. States don't have to be evil. We use the word state in this country and in this movement as though it always has to be an evil thing. I haven't committed to that uh, belief because states can uh, rescue people from uh, all kinds of calamities and make possible a guarantee of opportunities that are not based on voluntaristic or associational relationships, right? So anarchists are great, but if an anarchist doesn't like me, then I can't participate in that thing and I've got to find another association. I'd like to have a state that says the road will be there, the healthcare will be there, the school will be there, all these things will be there. But one in which what happens inside is democratically determined, not top down, but all of us together constantly, day in and day out. 
And the last thing I'd like to say is to my sister who raised the question um, about slavery. The peculiar thing about the peculiar institution in this time in history in the United States is all those black people and brown people and white people and yellow people and red people who are in prison, most of them are not doing anything. Their labor is not being exploited. There's a new article that's uh, moving around the, uh, the United States. It was published by two historians in Tom Graham that says there are a million people in US prisons working. They're not. It's not true. They made a mistake, and they're going to retract it. It's not true. All right. So if we think about how to organize, I'm sorry, I went into four minutes. If we think about how to organize and what to organize about, let us be mindful, let us be abolitionists and mindful of organizing so that we make the world, we lead toward the world we want to make, rather than a slightly changed version of the world that we abhor. I'll be less than two minutes, I think. <laughs> I'd like to speak briefly to your question of what is incarceration in this system of global capital. The great thing about the abolition movement with respect to prisons is to get the message out there. It does not have to do with preventing crime. It does not have to do with protecting communities. On the contrary, it has everything to do with saying largely that only some people's lives are precious, to give a different spin to your point. Namely, the dominant overclass, still predominantly white, transnational overclass of elites, which however much um, different people from different communities move in and out of it, remains fundamentally exploitative. That's what I see incarceration being. We can make it complicated as we have the scholars who've done so, but it is a political economy of brutality, and it will get more bruta brutal if we don't leave it attended. Brutality in the human spirit has a way of taking over after a while. The hope, though, the hope for me. Um, before I'm a Christian, I'm a human being. That's why I can hang out and have more in common with atheists often than, than my Christian friends. But as human beings, I teach that the spirit that matters, whatever our religion, if we have one, is the spirit that owns the agonism and antagonism of struggle in the present moment, but then also knows that there is an artful reflex of resistance in the human spirit also that gestures to fight back. And our movements and our coalitions cultivate that artful gesture in all kinds of creative ways. Restorative justice campaigns. Uh, Dr. Gilmore gave a great e example of, from the Montessori School. And it's those cultivated resistances under the pressure of today's brutal antagonism that generate practices of liberation. I don't know exactly what they look like, but that's what we hope for and that's what we cultivate. And I still find that hope beating in my heart and I hope in all of ours. Okay.